Friends, this is probably going to be your only warning. What's about to happen in New England this winter will be called a shocking natural disaster. The media will explode with headlines about how global warming and climate change is to blame. We predict thousands of people will seek refuge in generator-powered public shelters while their homes are without electricity or heat in the dead of winter. Progressive politicians will demand still more power to fight climate change, but you'll know better. As you'll see in this presentation, there is nothing surprising at all about the coming crisis. Just the opposite. This disaster has been looming for a decade. There's not a single political leader who isn't perfectly aware of the growing risk of a serious crisis. They know Boston has been relying on Russian President Vladimir Putin's natural gas for years. And right now, there's virtually no other way to power New England's electrical grid. Likewise, every credible energy expert in the world knows this crisis is about to strike. There's nothing natural, there's nothing surprising, and there is nothing secret about what's likely to happen. But no one is warning you, not the mainstream media, not your political leaders, and certainly not the power companies. No one is gonna tell you what you need to know to protect yourself, to protect your family, and to safeguard your savings and investments. That's why, whether you live in New England or not, I urge you to take a little bit of time and watch this presentation about the economic catastrophe that's already begun. While the worst of what's about to happen will strike New England first, these same forces are at work across the country, and they put all of us at risk. There is a major change coming to the way we all live, work, travel, and provide for the safety of our families. And there's a very real chance that the Boston area will suffer a historic power failure this winter, forcing residents to spend night after night for weeks in public shelters, while homes sit frozen and dark and entire neighborhoods are blacked out. It's important for you to know what's going to happen. So first and foremost, you can prepare. But it's also important to remember that a big crisis like this is gonna make a lot of people a lot of money. After all, there has to be a good reason why so many people have taken extraordinary steps to make sure that America is starving for energy this winter. I know it sounds unbelievable to say that people in positions of power are actually planning this, but as I'll explain and prove to you here, it's true. Nobody else is gonna warn you and no one else is gonna tell you the real reason why they let it happen. Cities don't go dark and freeze and the wealthiest country in the world by accident. How Russian imported gas banned in the United States saved Boston in 2018. Let me just start with this so you'll know how serious I am about these predictions. As you may know, when Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula in 2014, the US Treasury banned Americans from doing business with hundreds of Russian companies that were involved directly or indirectly with the Putin regime. Among the companies specifically put on the no financing list was a huge Russian energy company, Novatek. Now you probably haven't heard of Novatek, but Novatek is Russia's largest independent producer of natural gas. And back in 2014, Novatek was still building its primary asset, the world's most ambitious energy project. It's called Yamal and it's Novatek's prize asset. It's a $30 billion natural gas field, pipeline system, and liquefaction facility. It's the largest energy production facility in the entire world. What's so unusual about Yamal, though, isn't just its incredible size. What's amazing is the entire facility, the gas field, the pipelines, the huge liquefaction terminal, all of it is located above the Arctic Circle. Building these facilities and operating such extreme weather conditions make Yamal the most expensive natural gas facility ever built. Getting Yamal's energy from the Russian Arctic to the world's markets required building an entirely new class of icebreakers with enormous steel hulls that are eight feet thick. When the project finally came online in 2018 and began producing liquefied natural gas and shipping to the world, who bought the very first shipment of Yamal's energy? Who would buy energy from Novatek, which as a Russian energy company was an international pariah? Who bought it? The US government, of course, for the people of Boston. This picture was first published in the Washington Post on January 28, 2018. 
It shows a huge LNG tanker lying in port at the Mystic River LNG Terminal in Boston Harbor. This was the first shipment of LNG ever produced at Yamal. How do we know? Because the Russian embassy in London tweeted about it arriving in England a few weeks earlier. But the British wouldn't accept it. So it was resold to a Malaysian company called Petronas and then sold again to the French company that owned the terminal in Boston. At the time, Boston was suffering a huge and severe cold snap. It needed the energy badly. And so the U.S. government bought the first boatload of Yamal's natural gas, Putin's crown jewel energy asset. Russian gas, produced in the Arctic, shipped halfway around the world, all to keep Americans from freezing. How could this be true? How in the world did it come to this? Well, let me introduce you to Ed Markey. He is the senior Massachusetts senator and the co-author of the Green New Deal legislation. Between him and the state's other senator, Elizabeth Warren, and the state's ultra-progressive attorney general, Maura Healey, they've made sure that no natural gas pipelines have been built into New England for over a decade. As part of their radical environmentalist agenda, they've also done everything they can to prevent further investments into fossil fuel production while shutting down nuclear energy too. And yet, when winter arrives, as it always does in New England, what do they do? The progressives from Boston warm their homes with Russian natural gas. And what are they going to do this year, you must be wondering. Well, that's the whole reason for this presentation. Because without reliable access to fossil fuels, there's no transportation, there's no electricity, there is no modern world. Without oil and gas, everything as we know stops. There's no light, there's no refrigerators, there's no Wi-Fi or computers. No one can travel anywhere. Everyone is cold, or if it's summertime, they're hot. Every economically productive human activity ceases. People are reduced to playing cards by candlelight and hunting for wood to make fires to keep warm. And that's before the rioting starts. So, with this much at stake, let me walk you through, step by step, exactly what's gonna happen next. And most important, how to prepare yourself. If Russia continues to squeeze and starve Europe of natural gas, Europe will run out of gas in a matter of months. And even if all available U.S. liquefied natural gas were to be shipped to Europe, it could only replace about 25% of the previous Russian supply. There is no way enough LNG can be sourced from the world market without very significant increases to prices. The result will be destabilizing rates of inflation across Europe and potentially severe energy shortages this winter. It will happen in Boston too, and possibly the rest of New England, mark my words. The resulting economic crisis will impact every American. The bottom line is clear. America needs to produce a lot more natural gas, like 50% more, which is around 50 billion cubic feet per day more. Fortunately, those rays of production are possible. America has the capacity to mobilize our energy complex to dramatically increase production and help reduce the prices and provide energy security for our allies. Construction can begin on vast new liquefied natural gas export capabilities, and we can ship enough LNG across the Atlantic to power electrical grids from London to Bucharest. Along the way, investors in natural gas production and infrastructure could make a fortune, which is in part why I've written this report. There's only one catch. None of these things are going to happen until the Biden administration changes its tune and begins to rein in radical environmentalists like Ed Markey and Maura Healey. It's going to take an event like the Boston blackout, along with persistent inflation and a recession, to make Biden change course on fossil fuel investment and infrastructure. It's going to take things like exposing Boston's dependence on Vladimir Putin to get the American people to see what's really happening. But sooner or later, these changes are inevitable. How do I know? Because there's no other practical way to ensure the reliability and the affordability of electricity around the world, not without huge increases to natural gas production and distribution. And right now, only a handful of companies are holding the right cards. How bad could things get in Boston and in America this winter? I want you to take a look at this. This is the LNG tanker Iberica Knudsen arriving in Boston for the fourth 
time this year. And a lot of places around the world, including in New England, natural gas is one of the main fuels for powering electrical grids and heating homes. That's never been a problem for Americans because we have some of the world's largest reserves of natural gas. We also have the world's most extensive natural gas infrastructure, pipelines that stretch all around the country. America is by far the world's leading producer of natural gas. And thanks to growth in production, led by the fracking revolution, America has also recently become the world's largest exporter of natural gas, something that's become critical to the energy security of the world, especially since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So why on earth was the U.S. government buying Russian gas for Boston during its winter emergencies? Well, it's no secret that Boston and the rest of New England depend almost exclusively on natural gas for their primary energy source. This chart shows how, since the late 1990s, natural gas has become the dominant power source for the electrical grid in New England. So no matter what the politicians and the media try to tell you about the wonders of green energy, windmills and solar panels, what they don't tell you is that fossil fuels still make up 80% or more of electrical generation capacity in the United States. And in most places, as coal-fired plants and nuclear-fired plants are phased out, natural gas is coming online at two to three times the rate of green sources, which are too unreliable, there's weather, there's night, and too expensive, they require batteries, to serve as base load power to ensure the grid's stability. But the physical and economic realities of America's energy grid don't win elections, especially not in extremely liberal and progressive states like Massachusetts and New York. The politicians in these states must prove their liberal bona fides to their voters by opposing any new production of natural gas, like anti-fracking laws, and by making it impossible to build new pipelines to transport natural gas into their states. They've killed virtually every new pipeline anyone has tried to build to link New England with the giant natural gas fields in Pennsylvania. Even though the gas pipelines serving New England have been operating at maximum capacity, sometimes even in non-winter months, no significant new pipelines have been built since 2008. As a result, the U.S. has had to import natural gas from places like Trinidad and Tobago, and yes, from Russia, just to heat the homes in New England every winter. Incredibly, New England's politicians would rather have us buy natural gas from Vladimir Putin than to allow sensible investments and critical infrastructure to utilize our own energy supplies. Experts estimate such policies have already cost New England residents over $3 billion in higher energy costs compared to the consumers in Pennsylvania. And now, after a decade of playing politics with the energy grid, Boston is at serious risk of a catastrophe with no other immediate help possible. There is, of course, an embargo on Russian energy exports. And now, all the other sources of LNG have been rerouted to Europe. Even before the problems with the Nord Stream pipeline, that's the gas pipeline that runs under the Baltic Sea from Russia to Germany, the entire world's LNG fleet had turned around and headed to Europe to capture the highest prices possible for natural gas. So when New England runs out of natural gas this winter, there won't be any gas available. It'll all be on its way to Europe. If you've ever been to Boston in the winter, you know, extremely cold temperatures are not unusual or a freak weather event. It happens almost every year. In January, Boston has an average high temperature of 37 degrees and an average low temperature of 22 degrees. It has an average of 13 inches of snowfall and there's less than 10 hours of daylight. So ask yourself, why would our political leaders allow New England and New York, that's 23 million people, to become utterly dependent on imported natural gas from places like Russia? Why in the world would they choose to use imported energy when America has so much energy we've become the world's largest natural gas exporter? It doesn't make any sense, or does it? These facts have been evident for over a decade, 
every winter the likelihood of a huge crisis has been growing. With the complete embargo of Russian oil and gas and Europe's energy crisis, it's now virtually certain that Boston and possibly other parts of New England and New York will be plunged into the dark and cold during the chilliest days of the winter. So who will benefit? And how has it come to this? Energy, the world's greatest prize. Since 2006, I've been advising individual self-directed investors on the development of U.S. energy resources. I was one of the first analysts anywhere to explain what the discovery of vast new oil and gas reserves in America's shale fields would mean to U.S. energy production. When I started writing about these huge discoveries more than a decade ago, few believed me when I predicted that U.S. oil and gas production would soon reach new all-time highs. Back then, you may remember, everyone still believed in peak oil, the idea that America would soon run out of oil. But I knew the opposite was true and told investors around the world that much lower energy prices were on the way. Those that took my advice made out like bandits, which is what's possible when you're able to understand major investment themes that evolve over a period of years. This approach has led me to dozens of great emerging companies during my career. There was Amazon.com in 1997 when it traded for pennies. It's currently over $115. Or like Illumina in 2002 when it was under $3 a share. It's around 200 today. Nvidia in 2016 at around $12 a share, now over 125. But there are lots of others. There's PayPal, Shopify, and Regeneron for gains of over 250%, 950%, and almost 5,000% respectively. But I have to tell you, what's happening in this market right now is far more important and potentially even more lucrative than anything I've seen before in my career. I'm talking, of course, about the quiet revolution that's happening in the North American energy sector. The point of this presentation isn't to tell you about America's ability to produce enormous quantities of natural gas. The fact is, America is the world's largest producer of natural gas. And since July 2022, we've also become the world's largest exporter of natural gas, with even more export production coming online soon. America's energy revolution is transforming the world's economy. It has led to immense wealth for American energy companies and even altered the dynamics of the world's currency markets, where the U.S. dollar, after a long period of relative weakness, has once again become the strongest major currency in the world. It's hard to believe how fast this transformation has occurred. Until 2010, America was still one of the world's largest importers of natural gas and oil. Today, though, we're a net exporter of both. And as you can see in this chart, our natural gas exports are absolutely soaring. It's very likely we will remain the world's largest producer and the world's largest exporter of natural gas for the next 50 years. We have over 100 years worth of production in the ground today, and the ability to extract it improves every year. Every American should know these amazing facts, and we should be positioning ourselves in the very best way possible in the face of the world's current energy crisis. And yet, a shocking number of Americans are in the dark, both figuratively and soon literally. Ironically, these problems that we're facing and the disaster we're about to see unfold in New England, they all have a single cause. What could cause large parts of America to be so completely unprepared for regular events, like winter? What could cause California's electrical grid to routinely fail and start massive fires? What could cause Texas, the heart of America's energy revolution, and millions of people to be without power for weeks simply because of a normal winter storm last year? The answer? Politics. A large amount of funding for conservative politicians comes from the oil and gas industries. The easiest way for their progressive political opponents to attack them is to spread misinformation about global warming and climate change caused by fossil fuel emissions. Take, for instance, Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who pounds the podium and declares that the world will end in 12 years. Climate change is our World War II, she wails. People are dying, she screams. 
If you've heard too much about politics lately, don't worry. This presentation isn't about global warming. I invite you to look at the facts and come to your own conclusions about if and how the climate is changing and what the causes of it are and what it means for the future. But what isn't in dispute is that natural gas is the cheapest and cleanest and most reliable source of stable grid electricity that exists with current technology. Without natural gas, the lights won't work anywhere on earth. And if political efforts to choke off natural gas in Europe and in America by progressive politicians may cause the biggest economic crisis the world has seen in more than half a century. The whole world is about to relearn the real cost of politics gone mad. And it's completely unnecessary. The only upside is, for anyone who is clear-eyed, there is a massive amount of money to be made from the soaring prices of energy. My job is to help self-directed investors like you position yourself to profit. And you may never have a better opportunity to do so in your entire life. That's what this presentation is all about. How to profit in a world gone mad. My name, by the way, is Porter Stansberry. I've exposed some of the biggest secrets in financial history. As I mentioned, I revealed peak oil was a myth all the way back in 2006. A couple of years later, I warned readers that the U.S. housing market was on the verge of triggering a stock market crash. In June of 2008, I warned specifically that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were holding hundreds of billions worth of subprime liabilities and that both would soon be bankrupt. Legendary writer Alan Abelson at Barron's said my warnings about the imminent collapse of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in 2008 were remarkably prescient. In 2010, I described in near perfect detail many events of the last decade or so. Riots, government lockdowns, rampant inflation, and a 77-minute video presentation called The End of America. You may have seen it online. It's been viewed over 100 million times. Hell, even as far back as 1997, I told my readers to buy shares of the world's biggest bookstore. That's what Amazon called itself in those days. You could say I have a knack for finding the biggest opportunities in the financial markets and for seeing clearly the biggest risks. The situation with the world's energy markets today is actually both. For many people, the next few years will be incredibly painful. I expect Europe's GDP, for example, will shrink by double digits this winter, leading to plummeting standards of living, rising political violence, and believe it or not, a substantial decrease in life expectancy in some places. Simply put, when the power goes out, people die. And that's what's about to happen on a very large scale. How ESG investing made energy vastly more expensive. So why would America's political leaders turn their backs on what energy insiders call the new Saudi Arabia? That's our shale energy fields particularly when there's so much on the line. Well, the falling supply of energy in America and the growing unreliability of the power grid is a direct consequence of politics. Money managers, major banks, and dozens of major private equity funds have quietly adopted a private label form of socialism called stakeholder capitalism. At its core, stakeholder capitalism claims that we all of the stakeholders in a society are the legitimate owners of corporations, not investors. Meaning companies shouldn't just be accountable to their owners, that is their shareholders. Instead, they should be accountable to the social goals of society. Today, the leaders of this new version of socialism have been demanding three things known as ESG. First, it holds that corporations should be accountable to the environment. That's code for avoiding all fossil fuel production, transportation, or consumption, justified by claims that any further emissions will doom the planet. Second, corporations should have an explicit social agenda. That means specifically choosing to hire and promote minorities and women, for example, instead of hiring and promoting employees regardless of race, sex, or creed. But the most dangerous aspect of this new form of socialism is how it's attempting to transform the way corporations appoint their own management teams and even board members. Third, the governance angle is designed to essentially take control of a business without having to actually buy them. 
This is accomplished by pushing companies to appoint consultants and other experts in subjects like structural racism and global warming to their boards, rather than large shareholders or real industry experts. Let me show you an actual case of how this is destroying major corporations and dramatically reducing investments in fossil fuel production. Last year, a tiny hedge fund called Engine Number no. One, this is a fund that was less than six months old and that managed a minuscule amount of money, about $250 million. It bought a very small 0.2% position in ExxonMobil, a business worth over $400 billion. Engine number one put forward an absurdly uneconomic shareholder proposal that ExxonMobil, the world's second biggest publicly traded oil and gas producer, stop producing fossil fuels and called on the company to redirect its capital spending on clean energy technology. Engine number one then demanded that four of its nominees be elected to the board, made up of 12 people, to make sure that these new priorities were taken seriously by management. But why would ExxonMobil shareholders want to nominate radical environmentalists to its board? Why would its shareholders want to stop producing fossil fuels? Well, they wouldn't, of course. And ExxonMobil's management team recommended that shareholders vote against Engine Number no. One's nominated directors. Engine Number no. One, however, was clever. It didn't really represent energy investors at all. Its founder is a San Francisco-based asset manager with an environmental agenda. Behind the scenes, it solicited the support of billionaire CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, who, through BlackRock's ETFs and mutual funds, was the largest shareholder of ExxonMobil. BlackRock, along with America's two other largest asset managers, Vanguard and State Street, have signed on to the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, which says that the companies they invest in will cut their emissions to zero by 2050, whether doing so makes economic sense or not. Altogether, these asset managers held 15% of ExxonMobil shares. Engine number no. one also coordinated with other major proxy holders like the progressive-led California State Teachers Retirement System, the Church of England, and the New York State Common Retirement Fund. These kinds of investment intermediaries, Wall Street's asset managers, large state-controlled pension funds, and other institutional managers are almost always led by Ivy League educated elitists. They believe they know better about what's best for America and for you. And because they control, even if they aren't the ultimate owners of, a huge portion of America's retirement savings, they have the power to radically transform every single public company in America. And it doesn't matter whether you, the actual shareholder, like it or not. You don't have a vote anymore, not in corporate America. At ExxonMobil, engine number one was able to elect three directors to ExxonMobil's board, or 25%, and they were able to push through a remarkable portion of their agenda, which is in direct contradiction to ExxonMobil's core business. If these ESG elites can take over ExxonMobil, they can take over any company in America. The stall in America's oil and natural gas production is having serious economic consequences. It's one of the main drivers of the inflation that we're seeing, and that hurts everybody. And unfortunately, it's going to get a lot worse for millions of Americans this year. The lack of investment in infrastructure, for instance, a gas pipeline from the Marcellus Shale in New York to consumers in Massachusetts is going to make for a long, cold, dark winter in New England. And then there's the situation in Europe, which is even more dire. So how many catastrophes need to happen before there's a backlash against these ESG trends that caused them? When will most Americans realize the actual costs, both economic and to our way of life, and begin a wholesale rejection of these ideas and the investors who brought them to the boardroom? It's beginning to happen. Attorneys general from 19 US states have petitioned the Securities and Exchange Commission to investigate blatant conflicts built in to the ESG investing practices at BlackRock the ESG flag bearer, and the second largest asset manager in the world. They're asking the agency to look into BlackRock's ties to China and the extent to which the firm is violating its fiduciary responsibility to its investors. In other words, 
They're wondering why BlackRock is using pension and retirement money from their states to do business with Chinese companies that have no ESG standards, while at the same time strong-arming U.S. companies to embrace things like net zero emissions. The next step is for these 19 states to pull their pensions out of BlackRock and ban any sort of state financial involvement with ESG-oriented firms. And that domino has fallen. BlackRock, Goldman Sachs, and J.P. Morgan have already been banned from entering into any banking contract with state agencies of West Virginia. Others will follow, which could only benefit retirement accounts in those states, right? ESG funds, such as the U.S. Vegan Climate ETF, are money losers, and they're underperforming their benchmarks. And the whole crooked game is becoming more and more blatantly dangerous to the world economy. What's the solution? The only way to provide for a growing economy, for an improving standard of living, and for an increasing population is to produce a whole lot more energy. And the cleanest way to do that is with natural gas. Within the next year, the entire world is going to realize that the best, safest, and cleanest way to grow the world's economy is by using America's natural gas. After years of declining investment, it will take three to five years for America's oil and gas companies to ramp up production to meet soaring global demand. That means investors in these firms are going to generate returns like they haven't seen in decades. Overall, the supply and demand characteristics for U.S. oil and gas haven't been this favorable since the 1970s. That's why the world's best investor, Warren Buffett, has been investing in oil and gas like never before. His investments during the first half of 2022 are among the biggest bets he's ever made. Just how big? Well, Buffett's total cost basis for Coca-Cola was $1.3 billion. And he started buying Apple in 2016 and bought $6.7 billion of Apple that year. Coca-Cola and Apple are right at the top of his signature stock picks and his best performers. His energy investments for the past year? Over $29 billion. When history's most successful investor makes one of his biggest bets ever, it's time to act. That's why I recently hired two full-time energy analysts from Texas and Florida and moved them to Maryland. Together, our focus has been on understanding how the biggest natural gas resources in America will be developed and how they will be sold and delivered into the world market. And we have found an incredible story. It's about three brothers who have built the largest natural gas producer in America from scratch over the last 15 years and they're transitioning their company right now to become an export-focused global LNG giant. Over the next decade, I expect investors in this company to make over 10 times their money. This is so important, I want to tell you the whole story. And to do that, I need to go back to September 7th, 2008. How the frack revolution saved America. About noon that Sunday, a small independent oil and gas company, Brigham Exploration, began drilling a well in the Williston Basin of North Dakota. The well, Olson 1015 number 1H, was founder Bud Brigham's last chance. The looming financial crisis meant there would be no more investors to back Bud's attempts to wrestle oil and gas out of the super hard rock of the Bakken Shale. His company was $300 million in debt, and his firm's share price was collapsing. The company in total was only worth $60 million. Bud couldn't blame investors for losing faith, pushing huge amounts of fracking fluid into long horizontal wells was a long shot play. The extreme distance of the deep horizontal wells dispersed the fracking pressure. In short, the technique couldn't deliver enough pounds per square foot of pressure to crack the rock around the borehole. No cracks? Well, no oil and gas flowing into the well. His existing wells in the area produced less than 200 barrels a day, which didn't cover the cost of operating. But with the Olson 1015 number one H well, Bud Brigham was trying something very different. He was trying something different because there was nothing left to lose. Four years earlier, an independent oil and gas company called EOG invented something they called swell packers. They were tough, rubbery membranes that swelled under fracking pressure, sealing off a portion of the well. Meaning swell packers could be used to divide up a long horizontal well 
and to several different zones, greatly increasing the effective force, the pounds per square foot, of a frack job. EOG had, so far, broken up mile-long laterals into five or six segments. Brigham figured if you drilled a far longer lateral section and broke it up into even more segments and you fracked the hell out of it, you'd probably get a lot more oil out of the well. So with Olson 1015, number 1H, Brigham told his crew to drill a 10,000 foot long lateral section. That's a length of pipe almost two miles long. And he told his crew to frack it into 20 different segments. No one had ever done anything like that before. Drilling the well took months, well into the North Dakota winter, and at temperatures well below zero. There was four feet of snow on the ground in late January after the last of 20 frack jobs. Finally, they pulled the last tools out of the well. Would it flow? You bet it would. The Olsen 1015 number 1H well began producing more than 1,000 barrels of oil per day and 1.3 million cubic feet of natural gas per day. With oil prices at around $100 a barrel and gas prices around $5 a cubic foot, the Olsen well started producing more than $40 million worth of oil and more than $2 million worth of natural gas a year. By 2011, just a little over two years after finishing that well, Brigham Exploration was producing 21,000 barrels of oil per day across its 375,000 acres in the Williston Basin. Before Brigham's Bakken breakthrough, the entire state of North Dakota produced less than 100,000 barrels of oil per day. By 2014, North Dakota had surpassed both California and Alaska as the number two oil producing state behind Texas with over 1 million barrels a day of production. That was up an incredible 11 fold from 2007 levels. Bud Brigham's Hail Mary drilling and fracking technique quickly spread around the country. It was a game changer, especially in the Permian Basin in West Texas. By 2014, the Permian was producing 2 million barrels a day, roughly 25% of all U.S. production. It was on its way to becoming one of the world's largest oil fields. Nothing like this has ever happened in America on this scale. And get this, the Permian isn't the only giant shale oil field discovered in Texas. The Eagle Ford Shale, south and west of Austin, is also among the largest fields in the world, currently producing 1.7 million barrels per day. All in all, in just five years between 2009 and 2014, Texas oil production tripled. That made Texas, by itself, the world's ninth largest oil producer, just ahead of Kuwait and just behind Iraq, according to the BP Energy Statistical Publication. The rest of the world must shake its head in disbelief when they look at America's natural resource endowment. By 2019, the shale revolution directly employed almost 3 million Americans. And now for the first time since 1948, the United States is energy independent. In fact, we're not only the world's largest producer of oil and gas, but we're also producing far more energy than we consume making the U.S. a net energy exporter. In 2007, before the Shale Revolution, Americans sent $400 billion abroad to purchase oil every year. Our annual energy trade gap was so big, it had become a threat to the stability of the dollar. But today, not only do we not have to spend $400 billion every year to get the energy we need, our oil and natural gas exports are making some Americans vastly wealthier. And it's time for you to join them. The Gods of Gas. Before the end of this year, the first international end-to-end -end production and distribution deal for American shale gas will be struck by a leading fracker, a small independent oil and gas firm whose production is centered on the largest natural gas reserve in the world, the Marcellus Shale. This Pittsburgh company, launched just over a decade ago by three brothers, could soon become the first super major energy company to emerge from America's shale resources. This firm, which I'm pretty sure you've never heard of, has suddenly, virtually overnight, become the largest producer of U.S. natural gas. 
it could soon be the world's biggest and most important energy company. Now let me say that again. A little company started by three brothers at their kitchen table in Pittsburgh could soon be one of the world's most powerful energy companies. That's a bold claim, I realize, and you may find it hard to believe. But just remember, no one believed me when I said the world's largest mortgage bankers, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, would soon go bankrupt. Nobody believed me when I said General Motors would soon be bankrupt as well, or that the same thing would happen to General Growth Properties. That's the biggest owner of malls in America. Nobody believed me when I explained why AT&T, the original long distance company, would collapse because fiber optics was making bandwidth essentially free. But again, that's exactly what has happened. If you take one thing from this presentation, remember these words. This company sits on a resource that's so big and is growing production so much, I believe it will become the world's most important energy company over the next decade. The company's growth over the last three years has been explosive. After a long period of exploration and drilling, it has been able to ramp production and dramatically increase its margins through scale. It has also made a number of brilliant bolt-on acquisitions, gaining additional reserves and pipelines. Here are the incredible numbers. In 2019, the company was producing $250 million a year in free cash flow. Those are profits that can be distributed to owners. Then in 2020, the company virtually doubled to almost $500 million in cash flow. And in 2021, free cash flow grew 22% to $607 million. But the real growth is still coming. This company's numbers are moving from millions into billions. In the first half of 2022, the company returned $1.3 billion in capital to investors. It raised its free cash flow estimates for the full year by 50% to $2.35 billion. And that was all before his most recent deal. In early September, the gods of gas announced an incredible deal to acquire about 15% more production, 11 years worth of additional reserves, and miles of valuable pipelines. The company didn't add any debt, buying the assets for cash on hand and some stock. On the heels of this latest deal, the company projected its share buyback for this year would double. We expect the company to produce more free cash flow over the next four years, five billion a year, than the value of the entire company today. How's that possible? How did three brothers from Pittsburgh take a small regional also ran shale gas company and turn it into an economic engine that produces billions of free cash flow and is the largest producer of natural gas in the United States. The brothers didn't merely cut costs. They also struck a deal with an oil major, a huge deal. In the fall of 2020, the pandemic sent oil and gas prices to multi-decade lows. This world-leading oil company wrote off its entire Marcellus investment. In fact, it took an $8 billion write-off. So the gods of gas paid only $735 million for the oil major's entire Marcellus operation. They practically stole it. The deal, worth 800,000 acres, assures the brothers' publicly traded company will remain the dominant provider of Marcellus natural gas for decades. Remember Maura Healy and her snowflake pals in Boston? The gods of gas could solve their problems in an instant. Massachusetts is just a few hundred miles from the Marcellus. But whether or not the Boston blackout results in new pipelines or more LNG exported from the U.S. Gulf region, or both, it doesn't really matter. If the world wants to have reliable electricity, Without burning coal, natural gas is the only proven energy source that's reliable and affordable. There is no other real world solution. Just don't tell the snowflakes. How much natural gas could the gods of gas eventually produce? The company currently claims 23 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in proven reserves. 
That would put it in the top 30 in the world, ahead of Mexico, Yemen, and Brazil, if it were a country. But the truth is, no one really knows for sure how much more natural gas will be recovered. Because as drilling technology improves, the amount of gas that's recoverable continues to grow a lot. Scientists from Penn State University now claim over 400 trillion cubic feet of gas is recoverable in the Marcellus Basin. But those estimates have been increasing over time, from only 2 trillion 20 years ago, to 84 trillion 10 years ago, to 97 trillion just a couple years ago. These increases aren't related to how much natural gas is in the rocks, but rather from technology's ability to extract that gas profitably. And in that regard, this company has always been a market leader. The company's proven reserves have doubled since 2016. It owns over a million acres in the Marcellus. That's more than a quarter of the size of Connecticut. It's a safe bet that the company's reserves will continue to grow for decades. To put this into context, the Marcellus probably contains more natural gas than all the other natural gas producing areas in the United States combined. The Marcellus alone probably contains more natural gas than every other producing nation except Russia, Iran, and Qatar. The Marcellus, it isn't just a big gas field. It's one of the largest reservoirs of energy in the entire world. And this company is the best operator with the most production and the biggest reserves. Its development will not only change the U.S. economy, it will reshape the global energy map for the rest of our lives. No one will produce more natural gas from the Marcellus or in America for the next 30 years at least. What does this mean for you in dollars and cents? Well, a company like this one that's producing free cash flows of $5 billion annually with a proven growth strategy, it should be worth at least $100 billion. That's around four times more than the stock's current total market value. And that's a conservative projection. It's based on an average price of gas below $4 per MCF, even though currently prices are over $5.50 per MCF. It's also based on the company not making any more meaningful acquisitions, which it almost certainly will do. And there's the possibility of vastly higher profits if, as the company has said it will, it invests in building its own LNG export facilities and pipelines to reach the global markets for natural gas, where prices are typically well over $10 per MCF. That's why I wouldn't be surprised to see the gods of gas earn returns of 10 times or more over the next 10 years. This is a great investment, as good of an investment as I have ever found in my 25-year career. But it isn't even my best idea to profit from the global growth and demand for natural gas. There's a company that has even more upside because it's only beginning to assemble its acreage and build its pipelines and LNG facilities. And the best part of the second deal is its founder is the man who started the entire LNG boom in the United States, building the first independent LNG export facility between 2010 and 2014. His stock went from $5 to over 150, and now he's about to do it again. The emerging LNG giant. Currently, there are only eight LNG export terminals in the United States. These are where natural gas comes in from a pipeline, it gets liquefied, stored, and then transferred to LNG ships for export to other countries. The newest LNG export terminal is Venture Global's Kalkaskiu Pass in Louisiana, and it's privately owned. There are, however, two other new LNG plants that are approved and currently under construction. These are both publicly traded via companies that own them. One belongs to a partnership between super major oil company ExxonMobil and Qatar. Called Golden Pass, it's located along the Gulf Coast at Sabine Pass, Texas. You can, of course, invest in ExxonMobil, which includes their ESG initiatives, unfortunately. But it's such a huge company that even if this new LNG facility is a bonanza, it probably won't move the needle for Exxon's share price. But the other, new, 
fully permitted LNG facility that's being built is owned by a small company, a startup, whose founder, as I mentioned, has experience building greenfield LNG facilities. This new company has a unique business model that's designed solely to serve international markets for energy. Its plan is to acquire natural gas wells in the Haynesville Shale, that's in northern Louisiana, and transport that production via pipeline to a new LNG plant it's building on the Gulf Coast. The pipeline and LNG plant is a $12 billion piece of energy infrastructure that has the potential to become one of the most valuable energy infrastructure facilities in the whole world. It's going to be financed in part from its own natural gas production, and most likely the project will be purchased even before completion by a super major oil company like Shell, for example, which has spent 50 years developing LNG assets all around the world. Such a deal could lead to huge profits for investors in a very short amount of time. Of course, this kind of an investment isn't like buying the gods of gas. This is still a very small company. Its share price is going to be very volatile. Moves up or down of 50% or more won't be unusual as prices for natural gas change, as prices for LNG change, and as financing options for the facility materialize. The next big move for the stock could come when the company announces funding for the next phase of the project. I'm confident they can get this done. As I mentioned, the ownership group is led by the founder of a company I have followed closely and have recommended at different times for over 10 years. This founder knows LNG export business on the Gulf better than anyone else. Plus, one of the other major shareholders is Paulson & Company. That's a hedge fund I respect tremendously. John Paulson is one of the best investors of the last 30 years, and I've been following his investing for much of that time. He's been buying shares since this company started construction. How much money could this company be worth over the long term? If I told you I believe this company will be worth at least $100 billion in 10 years, over 60 times what it's worth right now, I'm sure you wouldn't believe me. But I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Let me explain why. Why America is the next Qatar. What's the richest country in the world on a per capita basis? Lots of people would guess Saudi Arabia, or maybe Kuwait, or the United Arab Emirate. But it's none of those countries, it's Qatar. Qatar was a relatively poor country until the early 2000s, with a GDP below 10 billion. However, beginning in 1997, Qatar began to quietly dominate the world's global trade in LNG. Qatar shares a huge offshore natural gas field with Iran, known as the North Field. The field is an enormous resource, one of the world's largest proven natural gas fields with reserves of at least 896 trillion cubic feet. But Qatar didn't begin exporting natural gas in large quantities until 1997. Within 10 years, Qatar was the world's largest LNG supplier. Today, Qatar has eight massive LNG trains and six even larger mega trains which can liquefy huge volumes of natural gas for shipment on specialized LNG tankers. Qatar is investing another $30 billion in a massive Northfield expansion, which will reportedly increase production by 40% by 2025. The results of these investments are hard to believe. Qatar's GDP grew from 9 billion annually in 1996 to over 200 billion in 2014. Qatar's economy grew 21-fold in less than 20 years. The nation's sovereign wealth fund now tops $400 billion, making it one of the world's largest capital pools. With only 300,000 citizens, Qatar has a per capita GDP of $686,000 and more than a million dollars for each citizen in its sovereign wealth fund. That's the kind of wealth America could be sitting on. It sounds outrageous, I realize, until you run the numbers. The U.S. began exporting significant quantities of natural gas in the early 2000s via pipelines to Mexico. As U.S. production grew, thanks to shale gas development, exports increased rapidly. Exports grew 
from less than half a billion cubic feet daily in the early 2000s to over 2 billion cubic feet daily in 2015. During that time in 2009, the U.S. became the world's largest natural gas producer. Since 2015, total export growth, which includes pipeline and LNG, has been parabolic from 2 billion cubic feet daily to over 18 billion cubic feet daily. In March 2022, U.S. LNG exports set a new daily record of 11.9 billion cubic feet, which is about 22% of the world's current demand. By the end of 2022, when the new Kalkaskiu Pass LNG export facility comes fully online, America will have the most LNG export capacity in the world, surpassing Qatar. But these are just baby steps. America only exported more gas via LNG than by pipeline for the first time in 2021. And so far, none of the major frackers have vertically integrated their gas production with their own LNG distribution networks. There's no direct link between America's giant shale gas fields and the global markets, at least not yet. But that's exactly what both the gods of gas and the Gulf Coast LNG project are doing right now. And it's those Qatar-like returns that I believe investors in those companies will capture if they act now. So how can you get my full report? How can you start investing in opportunities like these? How to join the world's most elite investment group, Porter & Company. Have you ever seen investment research like this before? An utterly thorough and exhaustive explanation of a major investment theme? from the big global picture all the way down to the financials of the companies leading the sector. There aren't many firms in the world outside of captured research groups inside billion dollar hedge funds, banks and private equity firms that can produce research like this that's original, proprietary and incredibly valuable. But it's the only thing I've done for my entire career. As I mentioned, I started my first financial advisory, Porter Stansbury's Investment Advisory, over two decades ago. I spent 22 years building it into a million subscriber, multi-brand financial publishing platform called Stansbury Holdings. In the process, I traveled the world and interviewed hundreds of incredible entrepreneurs, investors, and thought leaders. Everyone from Craig Venter, who cracked the human genome at Solera Genomics, to Jim Rogers, the co-founder of the Quantum Fund with George Soros, to James Grant, a financial writer and a hero of mine. In December 2020, I retired to allow my firm to continue growing as a public company. Renamed MarketWise, my old firm went public in July 2021 in a $3 billion NASDAQ IPO. While I'm proud of the business that I built and I continue to be among the largest individual shareholders, I prefer the independence of running my own small shop. That's why Porter & Company's international headquarters is in an office on the top of my tractor barn. I get to work with a small group of friends, some of whom I have known since high school. Nobody gets to tell me what I can and I can't write, and I don't have to meet any demands for growth. We also have zero meetings. We work together, literally all sitting next to each other in a converted hayloft, researching and publishing major investment ideas. I'm talking about themes that will last a decade or longer. We only want ideas that we believe are way ahead of the market and that our readers will not find anywhere else. The gods of gas and the Gulf Coast LNG export story I told you about are quintessential Porter stories. This is what I'm talking about when I say major investment theme. Oil and gas is a sector I know very well. I was the first financial writer to break the story of the Eagle Ford, the first major shale oil field in the United States. I wrote, I expect Eagle Ford to yield more than $2 billion in oil and gas by 2013 and to increase steadily for at least 20 years. These numbers mean Eagle Ford will probably produce hundreds of billions worth of oil and gas over the next 30 to 40 years. The Eagle Ford went from producing virtually no oil in 2009 to producing a million barrels of oil per day by 2013. With oil trading around $100 a barrel, that meant the Eagle Ford was producing $100 million 
worth of oil every day, or $36.5 billion worth of oil a year. The Eagle Ford is still producing oil at those rates today, too. That shale field, and others like it that I wrote about over the years, completely changed the global landscape of the energy business. These resources led directly to America becoming a net energy exporter. And right now, I think what's happening in American energy is one of the most important economic stories in history. Here's where the rubber meets the road in all of this for you. By following these major themes that evolve over several years, retail investors have the best opportunity to make sustainable market crushing returns. I'm not interested personally in finding a small stock that's gonna go up a little bit next week. I wanna find a company that I can invest in for years and years and that will generate real wealth, the kind of wealth I can depend on, that I can plan on, and that can sustain my family for decades. If that kind of wealth is something you're interested in pursuing with me, I sincerely hope that you will join me today as a founding member of Porter & Company. But before you sign up, I want to talk about one more important idea that every energy investor should know. There's a way to own the energy, but not the production companies. There's a way to separate the cash flows from the overhead and the risks. It's a secret that I learned from one of America's greatest oil entrepreneurs, T. Boone Pickens. How to get all the profit, but none of the hassle. I was very fortunate to meet T. Boone in 2014, about five years before his death. We saw eye to eye about a lot of things in the oil business, and I had several very memorable hunts at his enormous ranch in Roberts County, Texas. He was a generous friend and a genius at business. The most important thing he taught me was that producing energy is tough and risky and requires huge capital investments over decades. There's a much better way to do it. And 1979, T. Boone Pickens created the first publicly traded Master Limited Partnership, or MLP. His MLP would own the mineral rights lying underneath his operating company's land, Mesa Petroleum. Mesa Petroleum would later end up insolvent and avoided bankruptcy only by a deal to sell itself for pennies on the courthouse steps to Richard Rainwater who unkindly threw T. Boone out of the company. But the Mesa MLP survives to this day. It's up 138% this year, and it continues to pay a handsome stream of dividends, currently indicated at a yield of 23% to its shareholders. It owns the mineral rights underneath several huge oil and gas fields in Kansas, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. T. Boone's revolutionary idea was to separate the income streams from proven and operating oil fields from the costs of finding and developing additional fields. These kinds of royalty holding companies still exist today, and the best one on the market is a leading royalty holder in the Permian Basin, which is America's most prolific oil field. T. Boone created the first energy trust primarily for tax reasons, but the advantages of these kinds of structures go well beyond tax benefits. The key to understanding these businesses is that they don't have to pay any of the production costs or take any of the developmental risks. They own the mineral rights and all the capital and operating expenses lie with the operator. That means as inflation continues to drive energy prices higher, the mineral rights they've acquired in the past become more and more valuable. These royalty companies can make investing in oil and gas much safer. They transform a capital intensive industry into a capital efficient business that's virtually guaranteed to produce increasing returns across time. In fact, these companies, they aren't really businesses at all. They're just a legal fiction that generates enormous wealth by separating the value of the resource from the risk and expense of the production. Well-run mineral rights businesses are truly one of Wall Street's greatest secrets. How profitable can these investments be? Well, the leading Permian Basin Royalty Company has averaged an incredible 77% free cash flow margin over the last five years. 
Since going public in 2014, the Permian's leading royalty company, production figures, have grown nearly tenfold from average daily volumes of around 3,000 barrels of oil equivalent eight years ago to 28,000 last year. Investors have reaped the benefits, with the stock outperforming the broader energy sector by a factor of three and a half to one since its inception as a public company. This is an incredibly efficient and safe way to own a huge stake in America's best oil field. The company owns mineral rights spanning across almost a million acres with over 9,000 producing wells. Buy the Permian now. During the past oil bear markets, including 2016 and 2020, the Permian suffered a shallower decline and a faster recovery compared with America's other leading basins, the Eagle Ford and the Bakken. And only the Permian has reclaimed new highs in output during each subsequent recovery compared again with the Bakken and the Eagle Ford, which both remain below their production peaks reached back in 2014. Going beyond oil, the Permian also hosts one of America's largest deposits of low-cost natural gas. Over the last decade, explosive growth in gas production has made the Permian into America's second largest gas basin, trailing only the Marcellus Formation and the Appalachian Shale. Today, the Permian is America's largest low-cost oil basin, producing over 5 million barrels of oil per day. And this royalty company continues to grow by continuously buying more mineral rights on proven oil fields. Reserves have grown by an incredible sevenfold, from 18 million BOE in 2014 to 128 million at the end of 2021. The best part of this company, given the current volatility in the stock market, is that it offers remarkable resilience against the inherent volatility of oil and gas prices. The cash flow statements for most commodity producers, like oil companies, plunge deep into negative territory during commodity bear markets because the prices of the things they sell go down while operating costs and capital expenditures remain stubbornly high. But this business model is designed to be immune from this defect. The following chart shows how this royalty company sailed through the 2020 energy price collapse with barely more than a blip in its cash flow trajectory. In other words, this royalty company provides all of the upside from higher energy prices with only a fraction of the downside compared to traditional oil explorers and producers. For such a compelling business model, you would expect the stock to command an extremely high valuation premium. Yet with a market capitalization of roughly $5 billion, the company trades at less than 10 times free cash flow today. The best part? Without needing to recycle earnings back into expensive equipment and other operating costs, that cash flows instead go right back to investors. That's how the company pays out a current distribution of $3.24 annualized for a yield of nearly 10%. No, this company won't see 10 times growth over the next few years, though it's not impossible. What is very likely is market beating returns and consistently high dividend yields. Most investors need income to live on and this is the energy investment that will provide it safely, while also still generating market-beating returns. If that sounds like something you'd like to hear more about, then I invite you to become a founding member of Porter & Company by signing up to receive The Big Secret on Wall Street. This is my flagship financial advisory service, personally written by me and two of the best analysts I've ever worked with. As a founding member, you'll get instant access to our full body of research on all three opportunities I've told you about today. That's the gods of gas, along with the Gulf Coast LNG play. In my view, these stocks could go up as much as five times over the coming months and years, and perhaps 25 to 50 times over the next decade. Then there's the Permian Royalty Firm I just told you about. That could provide you considerable income and appreciation. After we get those full write-ups into your hands, which will happen as soon as you sign up, here's what you can look forward to next. Every other week on Friday afternoon, The Big Secret on Wall Street will lay bare the most important yet often hidden or overlooked opportunities in the markets. That's 24 issues per year. 
each of which will explore a new investment opportunity or trend in exacting, exhaustive detail. I'm talking about research and investment ideas that are out of reach for all but the most powerful and privileged investors. In fact, outside of research teams, inside of hedge funds, banks, and private equity firms, there is no one else producing research like this. Here's the difference. Our research is written in plain English, not Wall Street jargon. Our readers seem to really appreciate this. In fact, I just heard from a few subscribers who reached out to say, I love the new newsletter that Porter is putting out for us. He has a way of being ahead of the crowd with his thinking on all things financial and has a style of writing that makes boring information quite enjoyable to read. I'm so happy to be able to read Porter's writings again. I truly missed him. In a world of everyday political BS, it's refreshing to receive the true hard facts from Porter. And here's something else our subscribers find a lot of value in, the Big Secret Library. In addition to your issues, which will arrive every other week, 24 per year, as soon as you sign up, I encourage you to check out the Big Secret on Wall Street's archive. This library features some of the best work I've ever done. I'm certain the most fun I've ever had researching and writing about ideas is in that library. And I'm convinced that when it's all said and done, it'll also contain my highest performing stock picks of all time. Be sure to check out the Goldman Sachs of White Trash, the secret behind T. Boone's fortune, and grab a bucket, it's about to rain gold. To make following our recommendations as easy as possible for everyone, each and every big secret on Wall Street stock pick is logged and tracked in our model portfolio. This makes getting up to speed on our investments a snap for new subscribers. And of course, you'll get updates on positions in each issue and special alerts when they're needed. Exclusive investment guides. Once you decide to join us as a founding member, we'll reveal our most valuable investment strategies for you, including the guide to property and casualty insurance investing, the guide to capital efficient investing, the guide to distressed debt investing, to name just a few of the reports and special resources we have planned for your first year. And then there's a private invitation to my farm that I'd like to send you. This is your chance to sit down with like-minded individual investors at my historic estate in Maryland and hammer out the best possible wealth building strategies for the coming years. I'll pay for the speakers, the food, the drinks, and the entertainment. All you have to do is RSVP. Space, of course, will be limited. So if you think you'd like to attend, let us know as soon as you sign up. And if you can't be with us in person, don't worry. You'll get a digital access pass so you can attend from anywhere in the world. Plus, you'll get recordings of the entire event so you can watch the speakers and presentations in your own time. If I were to charge for this, it'd be a minimum of $5,000 to attend. But for you as a founding member, it's included with your membership. So what does it cost to join Porter & Company as a founding member? Well, if you sign up right now, via the link under the video player, you'll get a 30% discount. Typically, a subscription to The Big Secret on Wall Street is $1,425 per year. But as a special offer, founding members can join today for only $1,000. That works out to just $41 per issue, which is an absolute steal given that any one of our recommendations could deliver tenfold returns. Not to mention all of the extras and bonuses you're getting as a founding member, which would be valued into the thousands of dollars if we were to sell them individually. All that sounds pretty good to me. If you agree, then all you have to do is make what could be the best investing decision of your life which is to join me as a founding member of Porter & Company. To proceed, simply click the Start Now button below this video. Once you do, you'll be taken to a secure web page where you can sign up either for an annual membership or if you're interested in driving down the per year price of your membership even more, you can opt for a lifetime membership. Either way, as soon as you sign up, our Director of Customer Care, Lance, will reach out with all your membership details including the bundle of reports featuring the Gods of Gas, the Gulf Coast LNG Play, and the Permian Royalties Firm that I've discussed here. After that, as mentioned, you can look forward to the big secret on Wall Street and your inbox every other Friday. Plus, an invitation to our annual conference, our full catalog of research featuring back issues and special reports, and a lot more. But what if you change your mind? No problem. If you change your mind, for any reason within the first 30 days, just give Lance a call and we'll give you a full refund. How's that for easy? 
All you have to do is click the button below to get started.